welcome everyone to this uh, COP, Window in the COP23 live from Bonn, Germany. Um, thank you for joining us uh, to get an inside look into this historic event. Uh, my name is Megan Van Lo, and I am the Programs Coordinator at Climate Generation, a Will Steger Legacy, um, which is a nonprofit in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And our mission is to empower individuals and their communities to engage in solutions to climate change. Um, so we work with youth, educators, public, and influentials to engage them in solutions. So Climate Generation has actually had a history of sending um, delegations to various COPs, the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change, Conference of the Parties, and since 2009 we've actually sent groups. So in Copenhagen for COP15, we sent a delegation of Midwest youth leaders um, to engage in the international negotiations. And for COP21 in Paris in 2015, uh, we sent a delegation of 10 teachers from across the country, recognizing that educators are critical messengers of climate and energy literacy for hundreds of students each year. Um, these teachers attended COP21 as both learners and climate change communicators back to their classrooms and communities. So this year for COP23 in Bonn, Germany, we have sent a multi-sector delegation um, of nine people from across Minnesota to engage in these international climate negotiations. So we recognize that it takes all sectors to address climate change and all voices must be represented at the decision-making table. So our delegates represent um, sectors in education, law, philanthropy, youth, elected officials, and indigenous communities. And we're just showing the world that we are still in, even though the U.S. has said they're pulling out of the agreement. Um, so COP23 brings together nations of the world to continue their work on strengthening the global response to the threat of climate change. And now that um, American cities, states, businesses, and citizens are taking on U.S. climate leadership, a strong subnational presence is critical to show the enduring U.S. Um, commitment to our Paris Agreement Pledge. So that's why we've sent this Minnesota delegation. Um, and they're part of the bigger U.S. people's delegation, including NGOs and elected officials from around the country. And so today, I'm excited to present to you um, Representative Melissa Hortman, who is uh, representing the state government sector um, with us live from Bonn, Germany. Um, Melissa is a seventh term legislator in the Minnesota House of Representatives. Um, she represents a part of Minneapolis's Northwest suburbs, including parts of Brooklyn Park and Coon Rapids. She serves as a minority leader as a legislator, she has focused on energy, transportation, the environment, and civil law. Uh, she chaired the House Energy Committee from 2013 to 2014 and chief authored legislation that created Minnesota's solar energy standard and authorized community solar gardens in the state. Um, the bill was signed into law in 2013. Um, and she serves at, on Rules and Legislative Administration Committee and holds a BA from Boston University and a JD from the University of Minnesota Law School. So welcome today, Melissa. I'm going to turn it over to you. And attendees, if you have any questions throughout the webinar, feel free to just chat them in the chat box and we'll get them answered at the end. Okay. So I'm up, right? Yeah, <laughs> it's my turn. Okay. Hi, it's Melissa Hartman from Bonn, Germany. Here it is seven o'clock at night. And um, we are staying, most of us, in Cologne. And uh, I'm in Bonn, which is about a 45 minute train ride away. So it's getting really quiet at the place where the climate negotiations are occurring. The negotiations are occurring on the United Nations campus site in Bonn. And, um, so as it's quieting down, I'm in the computer center, so there might be some background noise from the other computer users. And as, as soon as we're done with the webinar, I will be heading on a train uh, 45 minutes back to Cologne where um, I'm staying. It's been really uh, quite a privilege for me to be here uh, with 
a group of Minnesotans. There are so many Minnesotans here. Um, I am going to share a presentation with you to show you a little bit um, of a perspective from Bonn. Um, Minnesota has been really present in a big way. We have uh, delegations of students from McAllister College, St. John's, St. Ben's, the University of Minnesota, Carleton, and then there's an environmental school, it's a high school in Apple Valley called the School for Environmental Studies, and there are students and teachers here from, from there. And so why is it that Minnesota is at COP23, and what difference does it make that Minnesota is at COP23? You know, it's really important um, as we think about the big challenge that we have in climate change that we all believe in the fact that we can reach a solution. I think a lot of times um, people underestimate the power of public opinion in solving a problem like this. They think maybe it's scientists, maybe it's economists, market mechanisms, policymakers. But really, fundamentally, what's one of the most important things is that if people who are concerned about climate change believe that it can be done, then we can get it done. Um, not unlike when John F. Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon. We did not have the technology to put a man on the moon when John F. Kennedy said, we're going to put a man on the moon. But people believed it and people worked toward it. And so part of why Minnesota is here is, as um, Megan mentioned, that um, Donald Trump has really stepped back uh, in terms of being committed to the United States being at the table and being a part of positive action to combat climate change. And so the rest of the world looks at that and says, okay, the world's most powerful economy, the world's only remaining superpower is what we used to say in the 1990s after the, the Berlin Wall fell. Uh, if they're out, then should I be in? And so we thought it was especially important to come as uh, Minnesotans and as I'm also um, here with other state leaders from other states to say a significant portion of the United States of America, we're still in. So I'm part of a delegation that includes um, people from the United States Climate Alliance. There are at least 14 states. I think I've heard a 15th joined while we're here. So 14 states in the United States of America who are still committed to taking action on climate. These 14 states all put together, if they were uh, a country, would be the third largest economy in the world. So we're very powerful. California is, of course, gigantic in terms of economic power. But when you add all the economic power of all these different states, um, it's really consequential. For so, so for countries who had a hard time going to Paris and making the commitment to be in, we didn't want anybody to have a reason to waver. And so that's why we're here to say, hey, look, um, you know, Donald Trump might be out, but the United States of America a significant portion of us, we're still in. Uh, as I mentioned, the most notable person in our delegation is Jerry Brown. He's, of course, uh, leading in California where there's a lot of Democrats. It's pretty easy to pass climate legislation. It's pretty easy for them to be a nation leader. And in Minnesota, we have a very different economy, but we have still seen such tremendous benefits from working to combat climate change. Our renewable energy standard, our solar energy standard have created tons of jobs. So even though we're not California and we don't want to be California, it still matters what Minnesota does on the world stage. So the other thing that happens here is there is a cross-pollination of ideas. So there are people all over the world doing little things. There are businesses in Germany, businesses in South Africa, businesses in Kazakhstan taking action. And those business leaders are here swapping stories about the impact that it has on their relationship with their customers and their bottom line. There are young people from every country in the world here talking about how concerned they are about climate change and the different ways that they can be powerful to address it. So when you bring all these people together, we share inspiration, we share stories, and then each one of us can be more effective when we get home. The other thing is we can help connect people who should be connected to each other. Um, that's probably the best part of COP23 is all of the people that you meet while you're here. You know, Minnesota um, is really significantly committed to the United States Climate Alliance. Uh, the woman on the far left of your screen is Stephanie Zawistowski from the governor's office, Governor Dayton sent staff. He um, himself did not make the trip. The woman in the middle there is the governor of Oregon, Kathleen Brown, a Minnesotan. Um, but on that stage right there are representatives from 11 states who came all the way to Bonn, Germany to make sure that the delegates here would know we're truly committed. 
uh, a lot of what we do is informal. So here we are at dinner with uh, people from Colorado, Massachusetts, Vermont, Hawaii, and yes, we're drinking beer, and yes, we're drinking wine, but we're also at the same time talking about different climate policy actions that have been taken by Republicans and by Democrats. So oddly enough, the United States of America doesn't have an official presence here. So um, most of the countries of the world have something called a pavilion, and that is where they're showcasing the actions that they're taking. And when Donald Trump said he wasn't going to have a pavilion, a U.S. pavilion, which is just bizarre, um, a bunch of the states and private actors got together and said, we're going to have a pavilion where we can show that the actions that were taken in the United States to, to make a difference on climate. Um, this is what our climate action pavilion looks like from the outside. I think as a Minnesotan that it's really appropriate that they look like igloos. Uh, we had a presentation today where I talked about Minnesota's solar policy and it just seemed that um, there with all those McAllister students and the St. John's and St. Ben's uh, students that it was appropriate we were talking to the world from an igloo which would be something we could build in the winter in Minnesota, at least if we get enough snow. Um, so I have a little picture of Tinkerbell up on the screen. Why do I have a picture of Tinkerbell? Some of the things we do in public policy re require belief. Uh, when um, our banking system, for example, internationally and in the United States of America, it only works when people believe in it. And if people stop believing in it, they go to the bank, they withdraw their money, and we have a bank collapse. So. Um, the International Climate Agreement is not unlike the banking system. You have to believe in it for it to work. Now, so critics can always say, uh, well, what does the Paris Climate Agreement accomplish? It depends on how much you believe in it, and it depends on how much you're willing to work. Um, and given the, the, the actions at the federal level, um, that's why it's important we're here. But there's also things that we can only do at the state level. I had a college student today from St. John's asked me, um, you know, why do the people in the U.S. Climate Alliance keep saying uh, Trump can't stop us? You know, Governor Inslee said, no matter what Trump does, he can't stop us. And I thought that that was a really good question. And the answer to that is, he, whether we had a pro-climate action president or an anti-climate action president, there are certain things that we can only do at the state level. There's policy making that belongs to the federal government and there's policy making that belongs to the state government. And so essentially what, when Jay Inslee says Trump can't stop us is what he's saying is states have rights, states have powers, and there's areas within which we act. And one of the, the areas that Minnesota has been a, a world leader is on community solar. And it started by a partnership that grew out of an international dialogue. So, you know, I, I keep addressing the issue of like, why do we have to fly halfway around the world to, to um, do something that can improve Minnesota. Well, for the last five years, we've had an energy dialogue with uh, Germany, the country, and then a state called North Rhine-Westphalia. I blogged about this on my first day. The first person that I met was a state leader from North Rhine-Westphalia. And this partnership um, has allowed us to swap stories between farmers and cities of different actions people are taking that, that can cross the Atlantic and, and help um, people in the other country. One of the things that we really modeled public policy on is our solar laws. We learned from Germany uh, what they were doing that was so successful. We had almost no solar industry in Minnesota, but we knew that it was a great way to generate electricity, not uh, um, issue carbon pollution, but yet it wasn't really growing. And so we took a look at what Germany was doing and we used that as a model for our legislation. Um, when I first met the Germans and started talking to them about energy and their solar situation, they said the thing that we don't understand is you have the solar resource of Italy and you're not doing anything with it. In Germany, they have the so same solar resource as the state of Alaska. And people don't really think of Alaska as a super sunny place that's going to generate a lot of solar power. Um, but look, but Germany's been fantastic. They've been enormously successful. They invested big. They actually drove down the price of solar panels for the whole world by really going in big and have really transitioned their electric sector. And so when I took a look at how successful Germany was, 
compared to how much solar potential they had, I thought, well, Minnesota can certainly follow their example. The, another thing that's very interesting in Germany when they did solar is they, they did it in a way where they diversified the economy around electricity generation. They made it possible for the average German citizen to generate electricity on their roof and sell it back to the grid. That was something that didn't really happen that much before Germany went really big into solar. And when I talked to the Germans who implemented this solar policy, I asked them, well, what happens if your political leaders change? You know, we have elections in the US and then policy will seem to really change in one direction or another. And they said, there's no going back on our energy transition because so many German consumers are involved. They have 1.5 million people who are selling power back to the grid. So we looked at that and we said, how can we replicate that success that they've had in Germany in Minnesota. Um, and so we passed a law in um, 2013 to require one and a half percent of our retail electricity sales to be from solar by 2020. And with a goal that we'd have 10% by 2030. And that goal seemed totally unrealistic in 2013 at the cost that solar was and the speed at which we were adding it on our system. And now today, a 10% by 2030 standard almost sounds conservative. It's definitely doable. We can most certainly meet it. We would have never tried, though, if Germany didn't test drive the policy and show us that it could work. And we're a people and a country that's similar to Germany in so many ways. It was nice that they road tested the, the policy so we didn't have to worry about making mistakes. When we passed the law in 2013, we only had, um, I want to say it was 13 megawatts. Yes, we had 13 megawatts of installed solar capacity, and now we have 552 megawatts of installed solar capacity, and we're likely to have 700 megawatts installed by the end of the year. So we've increased solar 42 times as much as what we had before the law. The reason I'm telling you this is that public policy is important. You know, there are a lot of um, corporate actors here. There are a lot of uh, young people and non-governmental organizations, but there are state leaders too. And the reason why state leaders are here is because policy really matters. There are some areas where voluntary action and a hope and a prayer doesn't get the job done. And so one of the things that I'm really focused on is, is learning not only from the other state leaders who are here, but the other leaders from around the country, whether it's provinces in Canada, states in Germany, states in India, what are they doing at that level of government that's effective and that I can take home? I just want to finish on the community, the solar um, information that I shared with people here in Bonn today because this is such a huge success for Minnesota and not everywhere in the world has tried this yet. Um, but people in India and people are China in China are really interested in it because what community solar does, which Minnesota has, is it takes individuals and lets us add our economic power together to buy solar. We don't have to put it on our roof anymore. We can just buy a share of a big project somewhere. This is taking the power of the market and putting it into this heavily regulated industry where the market really doesn't work. And it puts all of us kind of in charge of changing things. Because it's been so tremendously successful, other, other entities are looking at doing something similar. And it's effective. You know, just the very first three contracts that Excel signed to start to comply with our new solar law will avoid 7 million tons of carbon dioxide emissions. So we can tackle this climate problem. I think one of the things that's really important um, about climate is that people don't get discouraged and they don't think that there's nothing I can do. It's so big or it's too late. There really, um, there really are so many things that are so effective that we can do. So that's, um, that's what I shared with the other attendees here today about solar. What I wonder is how much time do I have left? If you can give me a little verbal guidance on how much longer yeah. I should sit that. Well, I would say like um, 10 minutes. Okay. If you want to t chat more about your experience there or um, no questions have come in, so I'll keep an eye on that. But Okay, sounds good. Well, like I, what I was talking about before I asked how much time I had left is th that people have to be careful not to get hopeless about um, the climate problem because there's a variety of actions we can take as individuals 
and as citizens and as consumers. So one of the biggest things I think that's changing in the world of climate policy is the divestiture movement uh, at universities and through people's pension funds and things like that, where they're asking that their assets not be invested in industries that are contributing too much carbon pollution into the environment. So I would say if you're really concerned about climate, one thing that you can do personally that will make a big difference is take a look at your retirement accounts and your savings and your investments and make sure that you're not in any of the fossil fuel related industries. Quite simply, uh, all of us put together as shareholders determine what is economically successful and economically viable. And if we pull our money out of those investments, those will not be viable investments. So that's something everybody can do. Also when you're shopping, I mean, clearly you can make choices to buy products from companies that have signed on and made commitments. General Mills, Cargill, 3M, Target, all these companies have made tremendous commitments to reduce their carbon pollution. So you can feel good about spending your money at those businesses. And it's important, I think, as you're spending your dollars to know what it is that those dollars are paying for. If it's a company that's made a commitment to reduce their carbon emissions, you can feel confident that you're not making the planet worse by uh, engaging in commercial transactions with those companies. But, you know, my sphere of influence is politics. So to me, everything comes down to elections. Really, what is possible in the world, whether it's who gets elected the United States president or what kind of state legislature we have or um, what kind of city council you have, it matters if people show up and vote. I know um, sometimes people feel like one vote, you know, what difference does it make? But you really can see, for example, in the last U.S. presidential election, which was really close in terms of um, the popular vote that led to the allocation of the electoral college votes that it really mattered if you care about climate, whether you showed up and voted in the 2016 election. So what I would say is that individuals should understand that they're very powerful and that they can really make a difference, but the, the most significant ways that they can make a difference is how they use their dollars and how they use their vote. So I don't know, do we have any questions? <laughs> um, well, I have one here, could you, um, Maybe speak to what the other representatives or elected officials that are attending COP23 are, are doing. You know, you spoke to what you have been up to, but do you know what others are doing? I think, the climate alliance? Uh, I think um, largely the same thing. One of the things we want to do is make sure that the people in the other countries know that the United States is, is still committed in, in, to a large extent in our economy. Now, California is unique. Um, California is uniquely large in terms of its economic power and its population. If it were a country, it would be the fifth or sixth largest country in the world. So Cal California is doing something a little bit different here. They are looking for a seat at the table, actually. They are looking for a role where they can be at the table to talk about how some of these decisions get made. I'll give you one example. In the emissions trading scheme that they're negotiating here at this international agreement, it will directly impact what California can do in its emissions trading system. But because the United Nations process is nation to nation, California doesn't have a voice. When the, when the United States of America is not at the negotiating table saying, hey, we want to help shape this emissions trading scheme, California loses an opportunity to have its point of view heard. So what California is trying to figure out with the United Nations is how do we let our perspective be heard when our national representatives are not participating and or when their their interests are completely different from ours. So my understanding is that uh, Governor Jerry Brown has, as a result of these efforts, been appointed a special uh, representative of subnational governments and so that they have found a way to get a seat at the table. That's something different California is doing that not everybody else is doing. Interesting. That's cool. Um, I guess looking to the future then, um, once you get back to Minnesota, what do you hope to do once you're back home after this experience at COP23? You know, I've talked about it. I've talked about it a little bit as how important elections are. So while I'm here, I'm not a negotiator, clearly. I don't work for the United States government. I don't have a professional job here. This is just basically about conveying a message to the rest of the world. 
And um, so what it has made me really focus on is going home and making sure that the elections go in such a way that we can move forward in taking climate action and promoting more clean energy. So I guess in a way it's increased my resolve and my commitment to the political system. You know, being involved in politics is exhausting because it involves a lot of contact with the public. It involves a lot of contact with people who disagree strongly with you on issues. And I think too often, our politics have gotten really ugly and uh, where people personalize disputes. And so they have to, if they don't like the opponent's policies, they have to sort of demonize their political opponent. So it's very tempting to say, hey, there's a different way to earn a living and I could you know, do something different to pay my mortgage. But when I'm in an environment like this and I see how consequential these decisions are, I'm redoubled in my commitment to talking to voters and making sure that elections go the way that I hope that they will go. You know, there's island nations that are on the verge of being wiped out, completely wiped off the planet because of sea rise. And when you're here and you see the people who will lose their home if we don't do something, um, it, it is, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say inspiring is the right word. It just uh, creates a, a lot of determination because how could we not do everything we can to help other people? Mm -hmm. You know, they say it's very hard for people to become sympathetic to a general proposition, but we as human beings can relate to other individual human beings. So seeing the people is very powerful. Knowing that an island is going to be wiped off the face of the earth is something different than seeing the people from the island who don't know where they're going to live next. Yeah, that's really real. And I'm sure that you've encountered a lot of folks um, at these negotiations. Do you have a specific experience that you can recall on that was unique that you've had so far? Or are you looking forward to um, connecting with certain people while you're there? Well, tomorrow I'm going to go to the higher education meeting um, at nine o'clock in the morning. So the way the United Nations works is it is uh, nation to nation negotiations, but they do have observer parties and they have different groups of observer parties They have businesses and they call the businesses bingo. So it's like business interests, non-government organizations, and they have young people and they call that young go. Well, Ringo is uh, a delegation I was part of when I came to Paris and uh, Marrakesh in the prior two uh, conferences of the parties. And RINGO stands for Research Institution NGO. The University of Minnesota is a RINGO, for example. So tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. when I go to the RINGO meeting, I'm looking forward to connecting with all the college students and all the professors are here who are here because they do a lot of different really interesting things. Um, some colleges have programs where they connect their students up with really small governments that don't have a lot of resources and their students kind of serve as advisors and workers for those for those countries and they usually have a really good idea how the negotiations are going so what they're doing here this year um, before donald trump got elected it was expected that this would be a boring cop and the reason it would be boring is they're writing the rule book to implement paris and so the big exciting moment was when we all agreed to Paris. That's like saying on New Year's Day, I'm going to lose 25 pounds. Well, now it's like February 20th, it's five in the morning, and we got to get out of bed and go to the gym. And so we're at the part of implementing the, the agreement that's difficult, and it's just work, and it's just a grind, but it's what we have to do to make what we agreed to reality. So it's hard to follow all these negotiations and to understand whether it's going well or whether it's going poorly. So I'm looking forward to these other college professors who are much more experienced than me to help me understand how those individual negotiations are going. Awesome. I love that analogy. That's great. Because <laughs> <laughs> we all do love our New Year's resolutions, but we hate to uh, do the work that is required to fill them out. Right, right. <laughs> Well, thanks so much, Melissa. I'm just going to let the folks know that um, they can save the date. We're going to have a panel from our delegates um, who went to COP23 um, when they're back here in Minnesota on Monday, November 27th um, at noon. So you can tune in virtually or attend it actually in person at the University of Minnesota St. Paul campus. Um, and then you should also just follow 
um, us and you can follow the hashtag MNCOP23 on social media and um, just receive the updates and check out Melissa's blog that comes through um, the next few days that she's there. So well, thanks for organizing yeah. and um, I hope that what I said was at least um, some insights on what's going on in Bonn. Yes, super inspirational too. So I'm like, oh yes, keep it up. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Bye.